Christmas card this morning. It didn't come with the regular mail for some reason. That was a bit strange. It was also strange that it was addressed for my friend Techno. It read, Hey Rob, if you're reading this, that means I'm dead. I just want to say thanks. I'll see you soon. Hopefully not too soon. Go get drunk on me. Techno. Techno Stipes. What a guy he was. He always said he'd never make it to 40. A year and a half earlier, I was on a plane to China. I was on my way to see Techno. He was at the military hospital in Guangzhou, waiting for a new liver. His father sent me with two clear instructions. One, gotta get Techno to stop drinking, at least long enough to receive a liver transplant. And two, get him back home to Vancouver. Get Techno to stop drinking, that's not gonna be easy. Cause that's what Techno really liked to do, was drink and smoke and fight. He was in no condition to fight. He was sick. He was really sick. He was crippled from a car accident when he was 17. But that's not how he lost his big toe. He lost that in a motorbike accident. Yeah, he, he was broken all right. What was he fighting for anyways? What was he still doing in China? I first met Techno in the fall of 1978. My first memory of Techno was, uh, we were playing soccer on this field and the ball was coming right to me. Right when I was about to jump for it, this kid jumped right in front of me and he jumped higher than I'd ever seen anybody jump before. And he chested the ball and sort of trapped it. And then he kicked it from about halfway across the field. And I'm pretty sure he scored. Another time, there was this uh, sports day at school. And I remember he casually picked up this ball and he chucked it right across the field. I remember going up after him and thinking, oh, I could do that. And I chucked the ball as hard as I could. And it only went halfway across the field. For the next little while, I went to that school on weekends and practiced throwing balls to see if I could throw it across the field. I never got anywhere near it. But I'll tell you one thing. Techno was fast. Techno was the fastest human I'd ever seen. When he ran, he just took off. There's no way you could ever catch him. And so, there I was. I couldn't really chuck a ball too far, and I didn't really play hockey, and I didn't really play soccer either. All I did all the time was I used to draw. And that's the one thing I could do that Techno couldn't really do. And so, we became friends after that. One day Techno said, Hey, do you want to go shoot some balls around after school? And I said, yeah, okay. In the middle of his playing around, Techno went berserk. He proceeded to break about 20 windows at the school. We were walking home. And we got picked up by a squad car. And I remember thinking, I really didn't like to be in the back of a squad car. I looked over and Techno thought it was great. And that kind of explains the difference between the two of us. And we were only like 12 years old. And he used to tell us these stories about fucking his girlfriend. And I remember I didn't even have pubic hair yet. Like that's how young we were. I guess that's the thing with him. It seemed like he could always just pull it off. Whether he was diving off a cliff or riding a skateboard through traffic. It just seemed like he could always just pull it off.
to befriend Techno was to board a thrill ride of some sort. Techno pushed the limits of whatever situation he was in. The greater the danger, the greater the thrill. Techno started hanging around with a bunch of dickheads wearing alligator shirts with the collars turned up. I didn't really care much for these guys, but I have to admit, they were getting lots of pussy. One evening, Techno phoned me up and asked me if I wanted to go to a party at the other end of town with his dickhead buddies. I declined. It was the summer of our graduation. We were 17. Techno was completely in control, and completely out of control at the same time. An emergency crew showed up to the scene of the accident, and Techno was nowhere to be seen. After some time they found him in a bush, 50 yards away from the crash site. He was busted up pretty good. He nearly lost a leg and there was some significant brain trauma. He drifted in and out of consciousness long enough to wave goodbye to me. I was on my way to the airport. I was off to Calgary to become a realtor. Techno had a very long recovery and his friends gradually stopped visiting. He had burned a lot of bridges right before the accident. He must have been very lonely, sitting in the hospital for the better part of two years, wondering where all your friends are. But recovery did. His speech was different, slower and slurred, and he had a limp. I'd come by and visit him whenever I was in town. I feel lucky. I just feel that this is right around the time he started to drink regularly. One day, Techno announced that his insurance settlement came in. This time he wasn't lying. One and a half million dollars. It took the lawyers 10 years to settle his case. There were many points in Techno's life where you could say this was the beginning of all his troubles. The car accident was surely one of these points. The day a settlement came in was another. And that's when Jennifer entered the scene. She was a damn drunk. When she was done with him, he too would be a damn drunk. was a funny millionaire. He dressed and acted like a skid. He smoked dog ends off the street. He 
This drink of choice was pear cider. Techno asked me to be the best man at his wedding. I refused. His wife poured spaghetti on his head and burned his eyelids with cigarette butts. I'm not sure where this happens on the timeline, but one day Techno was riding his motorbike. As he was looking back to merge onto the highway, he ran into the merge sign. The sign clipped the toe pedal right off of his motorbike and took his big toe right along with it. This would add an even more pronounced limp to his walk. More time passed. where he lived to visit him. I pulled over. As he bent down to lean into the window, I noticed he had a really yellow complexion. Apparently he was given bad blood from the hospital and contracted hepatitis C. He would eventually sue the hospital for another $600,000. By this time, Techno was very rich. He always had an odd assortment of hangers-on available to do odd jobs for him. There was Freddy the Freeloader, Dump Truck, Teddy Two Fingers, and Dog Breath. This guy was a piece of work. Most of them were crackheads. Techno could stay up for days on end, polish off dozens of pear cider in one sitting. He'd get drunk and get on the horn and call everyone he knew and invite them to parties at his buddy's warehouse. He claimed the celebrities would be in attendance, like that douchebag from Nickelback. No one I ever knew went to these parties. Techno knew his days were numbered. He carried on as if he just didn't care. According to him, he'd been right on the edge. He wanted to live. He loved life, in fact. He just had so much pain. Pain in his legs. He said the hep C was terribly painful. He was always vomiting. He loved to drink and claimed this was the only thing that relieved his pain. The combination of drinking and the hep C wore out his liver in pretty short order. The Canadian Transplant Society refused to put him on the 10 year waiting list for a new liver unless he stopped drinking. Ten years, he'd be dead anyways. Catch 22. Later. I was in China. I received an email from Techno's mother saying that he too was in China. Perhaps I could go see him. As it turned out, he wasn't far away from where I was. He was there with his second wife. What was Techno doing in China? Techno met Vince in some unlikely place in Vancouver, in a pub. Vince was in the business of organizing transplant services for those in need. Techno was on his last legs. These services did not come cheap, however. A quarter of a million dollars up front. He promised that Techno would be back home in six weeks with a new liver. We met him at the White Swan restaurant in Guangzhou. It didn't look too good. He was totally sketched out. I found it strange at dinner when Techno ordered a cocktail that it meant no resistance from his wife. They both assured me that his old liver was shot anyways and that he'd be receiving a new one soon. That all seemed perfectly logical to me and I also ordered a cocktail. It was a perfectly festive evening. Techno's drinking soon erupted into utter chaos, just like it always did. He was making things more difficult, in spite of us all there trying to help him. We left secure in the knowledge that Techno would soon be back home with a new liver. 
Months passed. I got word Techno was still in China, still waiting for a liver. Except now the situation had spun completely out of control. His wife left him there by himself. He started drinking again. It really didn't look like Techno was going to make it home alive. I met with Techno's father. We cooked up this plan to try to get Techno back home one way or the other. I phoned him up and I said, look it, I'm going to come out there and I'm going to try to get you back home again. And all he said was, well, hurry the fuck up. I really didn't want to go back to China. So there I am on the airplane. I could see the sprawling mass of Guangzhou appear out of the haze. And as the plane approached the runway, the real work was just about to begin. I passed through customs and entered the main concourse of the airport. There was a little girl there named Flora holding my name on a card. We exchanged greetings and she went off to look for Techno. After a while, Techno appeared. He shook my hand. His expression was something like, Thanks for coming here, man. Mine was, now let's get you the fuck out of here. Back at the military hospital, I met Dr. Lee. He explained to me that it was imperative that Techno quit drinking. The sooner he quit, the sooner he was able to receive a new liver. It was that simple. And also, if I could get rid of that damn cat in his room. I turned to Techno. Okay, where is it? He knew exactly what I was talking about. He produced a bottle of Baijiu. He was mixing it with Gatorade. All of it, I said. It took a while, but eventually he gathered up all his various stashes of liquor hidden around his room. Satisfied, I dumped it all out in the toilet. He didn't like that very much. On the way out, I grabbed the cat and released it in the courtyard in the rear of the building. And then I checked into the hotel next to the hospital. I set up my computer and scanner and got busy on my second book. The next day I went to go visit Techno in his room. He was in the middle of his daily routine. He was sitting on the side of his bed, vomiting into a trash bin. Flora was there, fussing with his hair, straightening out his shirt. I busied myself with something. I noticed the cat had somehow returned to the room. I removed it again. Techno was hooked up to an intravenous trip for the rest of the morning. We watched an episode of Seinfeld. I'm not sure what was in that trip, but it surely kept him alive all these months. Techno rarely got going until mid-afternoon, and then we would set out on a little adventure. This was usually something simple like going for lunch. He had the hospital address written on a piece of paper and set in plastic. This was tied around his neck with a piece of string. It said something like, if you find me, please return me to dot dot dot. Simple but effective. He had a collection of business cards from local restaurants he'd show to taxi drivers. On this particular day, we were going to the German restaurant. He of course immediately ordered a cocktail, which I had to confiscate. I always felt like a fucking cop when I was with that guy. It was normal for him to shut down for a while after lunch. This he did with much discomfort. After about an hour, he'd bum a smoke off some poor Chinese fellow. And then we would get back to the hospital. And he'd go for a nap back in his room. And I'd continue working on my book back at the hotel. At night, I'd come by for another generous dose of Seinfeld. This routine would repeat itself like clockwork. A week later, my wife arrived. Thank God, I was already going nuts. Back at the hospital, I continued to remove the cat from Techno's room every day. What the fuck? Techno didn't know what was going on either. I brought Techno food every morning. 
he'd look at it and grimace and say something like, oh, I can't eat that kind of lettuce or I can't eat bananas without sprinkles on it or something retarded like that. Seinfeld, then Friends, then we discovered My Name is Earl. Other than that, there wasn't much to mark the passing of time. Techno had his good days and his bad days. He looked forward to a special meal for days. Techno's immune system was so low, a piece of fish that was slightly off, or some other funky food, would put him down for a week or two. That was sad when Techno got sick like that. One day we were in his room watching TV and he got up and hobbled to the bathroom with the IV pole. When he got out he said, look, I dragged the IV pole to the bathroom and I wasn't even hooked up to it. We laughed until we cried. I think we were cracking up. Just then the door opened and a hand dropped the cat back in the room. Things were getting tense back in Vancouver. Techno and his father were having a bitter dispute about money. I saw Techno cry that day. I'd never seen that before. Thank God Flora was there to put her arm around him because I didn't know what the hell to do. making great progress on my book. I had no distractions in China. Sometimes Techno would come and visit me in the hotel room. After a while, he'd say something like, I gotta go take my pill, or I, I gotta go get something from my room. I'd give him about five minutes, and then I'd go chasing after him. I hated being a cop, but I was actually pretty good at it. It wasn't hard to figure out what Techno was up to. Except now, there's the three of us, three foreigners in China. We each brought something to the table, but Techno was the undisputed leader because he had the hospital address tied around his neck. Without that, we'd all be sunk. Occasionally a liver would come in that matched Techno's blood type. We were careful not to get our hopes up. We weren't supposed to know this, but the sad truth was Techno was waiting for a liver from some guy on death row. I asked Techno what he thought about some poor fellow dying so that he could live. I don't care. Techno's favorite answer. Eventually, a liver did come in. A real quality one, too. Apparently, a fellow in his early 20s was about to be executed. And he had the same blood type as Techno. We couldn't help but get our hopes up this time. Everything happened really quickly after that. Techno was prepped for surgery in the morning, and then we wheeled him to the other building where they performed the transplant surgeries. I remember looking at a pile of rubbish in the corner of the elevator and thinking how filthy this hospital was. I'd never seen Techno so scared. The transplant ward had flickering lights and holes in the ceiling. And then they wheeled him off through the double doors, and he was gone. Kung and I walked back to the hotel. That dumb cat darted out in front of us on the way back. We were called back to return to the hospital. Dr. Lee wanted to show us Techno's old liver for some reason. This 
infamous liver that's been the source of so much grief. I had to take a look at it. A couple of days later, we saw Tecno in the isolation ward. He was behind glass with some other patients. He had tubes running down his mouth, and he was hooked up to all sorts of machines. After a few more days, he had moved into his own room. We had to wear hospital gowns and masks to avoid him getting an infection. He jumped out of bed and shook my hand. He was clearly pleased. And then he went over to the TV and started adjusting the angle on it. The nurses were chasing him around the room. He must have been high on drugs or something because he sure regretted doing that later. Rejection was a big issue at this time. It was amazing to see the transformation in him. And it happened so quickly as well. First his eyeballs became white and then his thinking became clear again. Before the surgery, it seemed like he was always bogged down. It was an awesome thing to watch, but he still couldn't leave his room. He had beaten the odds. One day I was in his room. And he was sleeping. He was chewing and putting handfuls of air in his mouth and chewing. And he woke up and said, Oh man, I was having this great dream about food. I asked him on another occasion, what does it feel like to have a new liver? He said, it feels, it feels like somebody removed a frozen lasagna out of my chest and replaced it with another frozen lasagna. Now it was time to plan the exit strategy, but first we had to pay off the hospital. For some reason the hospital only took cash. Techno's father had to organize a massive Western Union transfer. It was a big fuck up. Western Union didn't want to transfer that much money. It took all day. But in the end, we had a big bag full of 100 Remimi notes. It was a stack of notes over two feet long. Me and two little Asian girls were my backup. We returned to Techno's room. First we wanted to take a look at the piles of money. I could see Techno's eyes light up. For a moment, I had second thoughts about leaving all that money in his room. The next day was another split second timing day. I had to collect the money from Techno's room. He was barking orders and being rude to everyone. I stopped talking to him for a few hours. I had plenty of other stuff I had to do. First I had to go pay off Dr. Lee. Then I had to rush over and pay the hospital. Everything went perfectly smooth, except one of the stacks of bills was short a 100 remimbi note. I made the difference with my own money. Then I rushed back. Dr. Lee had to explain how all the anti-rejection drugs had to be taken, all of which was in Mandarin. Then I had to rush back and collect Techno, who was having a smoke by the lobby. He had a surgical mask pulled down. He was wearing his black cowboy hat and his white suit, which is two sizes too big. I told him about the missing note. And he said, yeah, I know, because I took it. Long pause. I was steaming. Let me get this straight. You stole a hundred remimbi of your own money? Grabbed a cigarette, snuffed it out on the ground, and then we headed to the airport. First, I had to see Gung off. And then Techno and I had to get a plane to Hong Kong. And this is where the story gets really fucked up. I had overstayed my visa by a couple of months. That's a big deal in China. This caused all sorts of alarm bells to start ringing. Then they took us to a holding room. We were about to miss our connecting flight. There was no way Techno was not going home on that flight. So I turned to him and I said, you go. And I'll meet you in Hong Kong. And that's the second time I saw fear in Techno's eyes. He nodded, and then I have this image in my head of him limping away from me towards the gate. Meanwhile, back in the holding office, another guy showed up. He said he needed money. He made a space between his fingers about an inch and a half deep. Hell, I had a wad about 50 inches deep the day before. He had someone escort me to a couple of ATMs, and they shook me down for about 700 US dollars. He was actually a pretty nice guy. I was about one hour behind Techno. This is the first time Techno was unsupervised since he arrived in China. We were too close to home to blow it now. 
I arrived in Hong Kong and immediately scanned every bar and smoking room all the way to the gate. I finally caught up to him at gate 100 and something. He didn't look so good. In fact, he never really looked good again after that. He walked all the way from gate 5. I don't know why he didn't get a wheelchair. At one point he sat down on a bench that said wet paint. He had black marks going across the back of his white suit. When we boarded the flight to Vancouver, he had a business class ticket. And I was in coach. What the fuck? I could see the top of his cowboy hat through the curtains. I called the flight attendant aside and I said, My friend cannot drink under any circumstances. He's also very persuasive, so don't be fooled. I was totally acting like a cop again. And at one point, Techno came back to coach and sat next to me on the flight. He seemed so calm and happy to be going home. I hadn't seen Techno this happy for a long time. With all the commotion happening that day, I can't remember if he took his anti-rejection pills. He was supposed to take them twice. This next part of the story is a little hard to tell. It seemed like we had finally got home after this huge ordeal, and I handed Techno off to his folks. I sort of thought I needed some time away from Techno for a while. That night, Techno made a turn for the worse and went into pure rejection mode and began to turn yellow again. He was rushed to the Vancouver General Hospital. Over the course of time, his situation went from bad to worse. I couldn't believe it when I heard the news that Techno died. Techno was convinced that nothing could kill him. The truth is, is that by this time, there really wasn't much keeping Techno alive. His ashes were going to be distributed out of the cliff where he used to dive off about Atlantos Park. His father said a few words and distributed his ashes. Just then a big gust of wind came and picked up that big cloud of ash and blew it towards this group that was about a hundred yards downwind from us. And they completely got dusted with Techno's ashes. And his dad said, kind of comically, Son, even in death, you're still giving me troubles. But the flames, they won't get through 